Avenger 1.7 is out now. What's new? Let's talk about Avenger Create. This is the entry point to the Avenger developer experience. It's the first thing that many of you will have done when you first encountered Avenger. So with 1.7, we revisited this experience and we've changed a few things and made a lot of improvements. Let me show that to you. So I'm gonna go right here and run Venger Create. I'm running it from our local Vidaccio instance, which if you don't know, is a fantastic local NPM registry that I use for development of uh, the Venger core packages. First of all, it's gonna install the new version of Venger Create, and now it's gonna run. It's gonna help us set up our new Venger project. I'm gonna choose the Postgres database because there's a new feature I wanna show here. I'm gonna choose localhost, standard port. Now the name of the database is called Venger17. Now this is new. A new feature is that we can choose what schema we wanna use. And this is a Postgres specific feature. Postgres allows you to split up your tables amongst different schemas. So before we always had to use the public schema, but now we can use a different one that I've created, which is named Venger. Let's type in the credentials. This is all the same. And then now we choose to populate it with some data. Now, one important thing is missing and the eagle eyed amongst you might have noticed there's no option to choose between JavaScript or TypeScript. That's right. We've dropped the JavaScript option. So originally I put the JavaScript option in there as an attempt to make things more accessible for those developers who aren't yet familiar or up to speed with TypeScript. And it did indeed run you can run a basic Venger project just with JavaScript. The problem comes when you have to build anything. So if you're going to do anything non-trivial with Venger, you're going to be building plugins and plugins are built with this Venger plugin decorator. And the decorator is something that's really only in TypeScript. It's possible to do decorators in JavaScript, but it's extremely hacky. It's undocumented and I don't want to put anyone through that. So really all this time, the fact that we offered JavaScript as an option was not being completely honest with the developer because after a little bit of time, they were gonna run into a wall where they suddenly can't do what they wanna do and they can't follow the documentation. So I pulled it on Slack. Everyone was in favor of it. We dropped to JavaScript support in this version. Um, I don't think anyone's gonna miss it. Anyway, let's move on. We're gonna populate our new instance with some test data. This is going to do the whole NPM install thing. So I'm going to use the magic of video editing and let's skip straight to the end of that. Okay. Uh, we're back. We, we installed everything and now we're just initializing the server. We're going to populate it with some test data. Let's fast forward this bit. Okay. It's done. So let's go ahead and follow the instructions. Okay, and the first thing that's changed is the command to run it in development mode is now yarn dev rather than yarn start. So we'll start that up and at the same time, I'm going to open it up in the IDE and we can have a look around the folder structure because there's a few changes there. Okay, so let's start off with the readme. So the first part's the same as I mentioned, the development command has changed, the build command's the same. Um, there's now a command for production, which is yarn start. And there's some things about Docker, which we'll get into in migration. So let us look at the folder structure first of all. So one thing that I want to bring to your attention first and foremost is the presence of this file, the .n file. So if you're familiar with node development, you've probably seen this before. This is a way to store environment variables. And it, Prior to this, these were put directly inside your Venger config file. But now if we go over to Venger config, we can see that, for example, in the database connection, we're using environment variables for all of these. And these are automatically populated based on the answers you give while you're setting it up. So, oh, and by the way, this is powered by the very, very popular .env package, which is more or less a standard way of handling env files. And the really nice thing is that these are typed correctly with TypeScript. And this is done here in this environment.dts file. This is allows us to tell TypeScript what environment variables it should expect. Otherwise you get uh, type errors. So for example, if I would remove this username 
uh, definition here and go back over to the config, we should see that we actually get an error here because by default, any environment variable is typed as a string or undefined because we can't be sure whether it's defined or not at build time. So this is the reason why we have this uh, typings file. It allows us just, just to keep TypeScript happy and make sure that we're not having to do um, non-null assertions all over the place whenever we use a, um, an environment variable. So that's the first thing. What this makes really nice is that you can immediately start easily changing out environments for staging or for production and development in a very standard way that almost everyone is used to. Um, and when you do move to production, you just need to set the environment variables by the mechanisms provided by your hosting provider, which is, again, a very, very standard way of doing things. So it's been a long time coming, but I'm glad to say that we now support doing things in this way uh, and also provide the infrastructure so that you don't have to figure out all these minute details about how do you get the typings right and so on, because that did take me a little while to figure out. The next thing I want to show you is the way that we're handling migrations. This is something that came up quite often. Um, okay, in development, maybe using synchronizing to synchronize the database schema changes whenever you add a custom field and so on. But when it comes to production, you don't want to do it like that because you could accidentally make a change that causes data loss and you don't want to lose production data. So we've always said switch uh, synchronization off for production and use the migration system. However, it's not always been clear how exactly do we arrange our migrations so that we can run them in production. Uh, do we have to uh, remote into our production machine and like run the script manually? There's been different approaches and different ways of doing, doing things, but over the years, um, a way of doing it has emerged uh, with some big projects that I've been working with, and it works like this. If we look over at the index.ts file, you'll see now it's slightly changed, and before we bootstrap, we first call this run migrations function. Now this function has been in VengerCore for a long time. Um, it's been usually used in, as part of a CLI script, but if we put it there, it means that we can generate migration scripts and then these get built alongside our other uh, source files into JavaScript. You push them to your production environment and they get run automatically. Now this means before you do that, before you push it to production, you've got a chance to check the migration script make sure everything works okay, make any changes that you might need to make or any manual additions or removals. And then once it's all good, then you can push it to production. Let's do an example of it. Let's add a custom field on the product. Let's say we want to add um, keywords. And it's going to be a string. We'll just keep it simple. Okay. If we go over to the readme, there's a section that talks about migration. So we can run this yarn migration generate. So I'll jump over to the terminal and run that. Let's stop that running. So yarn migration generate, and we'll call it a keyword. And that's going to generate the migration for us. Now it's done, we can see it um, right here. So then we can inspect it. And the next time we run the server, yarn dev, we should apply this migration. Oh, there we go, successfully ran migration. So that's a way of handling migrations now that works both for development and for production. The next things I want to show you is the Docker part. So um, there's many ways to deploy a Venger app to production. We have a few more concrete options now. Once you've built your app using the build command, which I'll demonstrate right here, which is literally just runs the TypeScript compiler. We can uh, use a system that pushes it to production and maybe runs it with a process manager like PM2, or we could use Docker. And to help with that, we do ship now with a Docker file, which is very simple, but it will give you an image that you can run for both the worker and the server. And the run commands are given right here to do that. We also supply a sample Docker compose file 
which includes a Postgres database as well. Okay, so that's the changes with the Venger Create experience. Now let's take a look at something that's new once you've created your app and you're running it. So let's start this up again with Yarn Dev and we'll open up the admin UI and log in. Now the next part is about assets and our asset server plugin. So for those who aren't familiar with it, the asset server plugin is a really cool part of Venger and it allows us to do all sorts of things with our typically our product images, but it handles any kind of asset that you might want to have like a, a PDF or a video or whatever. It's very extensible. So one thing it allows us to do is crop and resize on the fly. So um, I can set the width to 100, for example, and I get a dynamically resized and transformed image. One really cool new feature in version 1.7 is support for next generation image formats. So we're all familiar with JPEGs and PNGs. You may not have heard of WebP and maybe you've not heard of AVIF. So these are newer formats that are gaining more and more widespread adoption in browsers. Let's go and look at the support levels. Okay, so let's check WebP. Can I use WebP? And if we look at the current versions, almost everything is green apart from Kai OS browser. Don't know what that is. IE 11. Okay. Uh, Safari is kind of stripey. Um, because it's on newer versions of Mac OS. Okay, so WebP is pretty good. And AVIF. Now this one is a bit more patchy. You see it's supported on Chrome, Opera, Firefox, Samsung Internet. So we're missing Edge and Safari. So this is a more a modern format, but it can be used and you can use strategies to selectively um, use this format. But how do we use these formats? Well, it's very, very simple. And let me demonstrate that to you here. So we've got an image right here, this keyboard. Um, if I refresh the page, we see that it's the JPEG version and it is 27K. So with Venger 1.7, all we need to do to get this into a next generation format is add the format query string. So let's do it in WebP. Okay. 17k so we just dropped 10k just like that now let's look at avif so i'm running um, a chromium based browser so it supports avif so if we look at that now 9.3k that's like a third of the size of the jpeg the visual quality is i don't know if i can see a difference so i'll go back now and back again to the jpeg and forward again okay i'm switching back and forward between all three formats here and I can see a few pixels shifting around, but the quality is the same, basically. So with AVIF, we're getting a third of the size of the JPEG. The cool thing is you don't need to go and like re-upload your entire asset library using a next-gen format. No, the asset server plugin will allow you to just display them in these formats just by adding the query string. So this is major. This is, this is going to unlock like a whole new world of... Um, page performance improvements by drastically reducing the size of the assets that you're sending down to your, to your um, users through the browser. So that's really cool. Um, there have been other tweaks on the asset server plugin. You can now upload these formats as well, which was not supported before. And we also have a lot more options on exactly like how, uh, how much compression you want to apply the quality level for the ver various formats. This can all be configured um, in the asset server plugin config. And apart from those two areas that I've just shown you, there are a lot more new features, fixes, and big performance improvements in some areas in version 1.7. Go and check out the blog post where I go into much more detail on these other areas. Check the change log and update to version 1.7 and let me know how it goes. I'm always happy to receive your feedback. And in the meantime, I'll get working on version 1.8. Okay, see you next time.